My name is Eva Carrigan and I'm here from Alltech and I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about issues that we have competing with antibiotic growth promoters. So firstly, we need to take a look at the bigger picture. We all know from uh, hearing it numerous times during this week that the world's population is increasing. With this increasing population, we're going to need more food. The increase in population, they're not only uh, increasing in number, but they're also increasing in wealth. So as somebody mentioned yesterday, the first thing people buy when they get more money is more uh, meat protein. So with that, we're looking at uh, trying to meet an increase of 50% in production on, um, in, in food animals over the next 50 years. So this poses uh, significant challenges to both food producers and also to governing bodies <clears throat> because this food is going to need to be produced. These people are going to be produced also, so we need to feed these people. And with that, it poses significant challenges because the food is going to need to be produced in a safe and um, a, a, a safe way with food security in mind, a traceable way and also efficiently um, because we're also going to have less feed uh, produced to feed these animals. So the responsibility lies with us who are driving research in this area and also with the food producers um, and governing body, bodies uh, to produce uh, this safe food. Um, so we really need to take it on ourselves to look at how we're going to uh, move when we have less to, to use less antibiotics in feed or in food production animals. So the responsibility is li lying with us to try and meet these demands of um, in increasing the food production and um, uh, in a, a safe and traceable way. So. I won't hone in too much on this point as we've been hearing about it all week, but antibiotics have been used in food production animals for the last 50, 60 years. And um, we've all been here debating their use this week, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. But basically what we need to know is that um, the uh, governing bodies are moving towards banning the use of antibiotic growth promoters in feed. So uh, that poses a significant challenge uh, to meet the demand um, of food production and how are we going to replace these antibiotic growth promoters um, to produce these animals. So it not only um, has issues, uh, when we're, the issues that we're talking about when we're replacing antibiotic growth promoters, it not only lies with antibiotic resistance, but it also uh, lies with food safety because uh, antibiotics uh, have been used in uh, food producing animals to control disease. So if you take a look at uh, zoonotic, zoonotic pathogens such as Salmonella and Campylobacter, which are already a big problem in uh, a zoonotic disease. How are we going to control these if we're removing antibiotics from the feed, which have already been uh, controlling these disease? If we remove the antibiotics and we don't replace them with anything, then we're going to pose significant pressures on um, economies because you're going to get a lot more sick people. Um, and also, it's going to pose a lot of uh, pressures on, on people as well because the antibiotics there aren't um, as effective as they once were. So also this is going to pose significant um, pressures on the good health of the animals because the antibiotics would have controlled um, the infections in the animals. But um, now uh, if we remove the antibiotics, what's going to control the infection in the animals? And this is going to pose significant um, pressures on the animal itself uh, in terms of animal welfare and in terms of meeting their production needs. So in order to try and assess where we need to go in terms of uh, developing alternatives to antibiotic growth promoters, we first need to remind ourselves why we use antibiotics in food production animals in the first place. So um, antibiotics have been used in food production animals to improve animal performance and health by targeting and destroying the intestinal microflora. 
and uh, this showed an economic benefit for food producers as it uh, led to improvements in the growth rates, the health and the uniformity of the production of the animals. But the size of the response to antibiotic growth from others uh, was also dependent on the farm management, the exposure that the animals were getting to pathogens, uh, the environmental stresses that were imposed on the, on the animals, and also what type of diet they were being fed. So in order to uh, propose an alternative to antibiotic growth promoters, um, any alternative must meet the same expectations of an antibiotic growth promoter and also must meet current regulatory requirements, being that they must be uh, safe to use, they must be cost effective because um, you know, there's not much margin for profit for the producers at the moment, they must be non-toxic, they must not be able to come resistant, but nobody can predict the future. And uh, they also must be efficacious. They must work. They must uh, improve the production, improve the animal health, and do everything that an antibiotic growth promoter uh, once did. So where do we start um, trying to replace antibiotic growth promoters? And um, I think that you know, you're never going to really come across something that's going to be as effective as an antibiotic growth promoter. And so we need to look at, um, an, at a holistic approach to tackling the problem. Um, this will involve educating and informing the food producers and the uh, food consumers. It will need, we'll need to try and improve biosecurity. Um, this is probably going to be the toughest one because it will be hard to convince producers um, to make a big investment into improving uh, biosecurity approaches when they're not going to see um, an immediate return on investment. Um, but we're also going to need to focus on gut health and immunity as well, um, which uh, if, we look, if we try and tackle uh, all these angles at the one time, then we might be able to meet um, the expectations of an antibiotic growth promoter. So, in terms of um, alternatives to antibiotic growth promoters, what options do we have? And the last speaker covered it in detail. Um, but um, a lot of controlling um, or providing an alternative to an antibiotic growth promoter uh, surrounds um, achieving optimal gut health. If you have optimal gut health, we're going to have an optimal uh, animal performance, and that's why antibiotics were used in the first place, to control disease and to improve uh, growth rates and feed conversions. So to achieve an optimal gut health, we're going to have to look at uh, the nutrition and management of the animals, and through this then we will achieve a balanced microflora, and this in turn has a, um, beneficial effects on the gut wall morphology, the integrity and inflammation. And, um, why that's important is because um, the, uh, the animal uses a lot of its energy trying to maintain the gut because of the um, challenge with pathogens and uh, so on. So if you can reduce that, it will give optimal animal performance. So there's many feed intervention strategies which are available that are alternatives to antibiotic growth motors, and these include the use of organic acids, probiotics, and prebiotics. And these work in a variety of different ways, such as they alter the gut pH to um, eliminate uh, the reproduction of pathogenic bacteria. They um, maintain and increase uh, mucus production, which has a beneficial effect on the intestinal morphology. They select for beneficial intestinal organisms, or they also uh, select against particular pathogens. They enhance fermentation acids, such as short-chain fatty acids, uh, which has uh, positive influences on the um, intestinal lining. And then in turn that these can also lead to improved nutrient uptake, which will improve your weight gains and your feed conversions. And they also have uh, different effects on the immune response of the animal. So if we take a look at just one particular alternative to um, antibiotics, mananoligosaccharides, which are a prebiotic alternative to antibiotics, um, we'll assess 
um, can it meet the same, uh, um, can it achieve the same things that an antibiotic growth promoter does? So when you're looking for any specific alternative to an antibiotic, you, ha you need to uh, address the specific issues that are going to, that it's going to have to meet. Um, so is uh, the mononolagosaccharide, is it safe? Um, is it cost effective? Is it non-toxic? It's unlikely to become resistant, but as I said, nobody can predict the future. Um, but the main point is, is it efficacious? Are you going to achieve the same things that you uh, set out to achieve when you're using an antibiotic growth promoter? So if we take a look at um, some a prebiotic uh, trial that was carried out in broilers, um, I think you can say that um, it does achieve the same aims of an antibiotic growth promoter, such as controlling disease, reducing mortalities, and improving feed conversion ratios. Um, in these graphs here, you can see that um, a mononolagosaccharide was introduced into a uh, poultry flock, and it reduced the uh, number of uh, salmonella positive samples in the flock by one eighth uh, on the previous production cycles. It also um, a reduced uh, mortality by a little over uh, 25%. And it also led then to improvements in free conversion ratios. Um, if you take a look at even the improvement in mortalities, if you take, um, say, maybe six production batches in a year and you're reducing the average mortality by over a quarter, you're looking at probably 10,000 more broilers in a bat in, uh, per year. Um, also, with the feed conversion ratios, um, you're probably looking at um, about 60 tonnes less of feed being used per year. So these are the types of benefits that we're seeing with uh, using alternatives to antibiotics. So um, I think we can say that in, in terms of an alternative uh, to an antibiotic book promoter, um, that there are benefits to using um, MOS and achieves the same uh, aims of an antibiotic growth promoter in improving mortalities, um, uh, feed conversion ratios, and pathogen control. But MOS also has other effects, um, such as improving intestinal structure, improving mucin production, improving uh, the animal's capability to digest the food properly, and also it has effects on modulating the immune system, which means that um, the animal is... Uh, better able to resist disease. So uh, when you add moss to a diet, you can also see that it improves uh, mucin production. And um, this is, mucin acts as a protective barrier against harmful uh, interluminal components such as the abrasive action of feed st <coughs> feedstuffs, um, bacterial colonization, and also from harmful toxins that the bacteria produces. And this, in turn, has beneficial effects on intestinal structure, um, which uh, leads to a, a reduction in cell softening on the villi. It means that the animal is uh, using a lot less energy trying to maintain the intestinal uh, tract um, and is able to better focus its energy on um, utilizing its feed a little bit better. So um, we can also see that uh, the use of um, a prebiotic moss in the diet not only has um, effects on phenotypic things such as um, uh, improvements in weight gains, but we can also see that it has effects at the genotypic level. So if uh, I carried out some uh, gene expression analysis studies and found that the use of moss um, in the diet um, regulated uh, mucin-associated genes in intestinal tissue, and these were upregulated, which kind of reinforces how um, moss can improve mucin production. Um, I also uh, looked at the effects of moss on um, different stress-related genes and also on genes associated with tissue damage. And you can see that uh, those uh, diets that had um, moss included in them had significant reductions in the expression of genes related to uh, stress and tissue damage. 
So it just kind of uh, shows you how um, feeding an animal can have effects at the genetic level, and it's not just the phenotypic effects that we um, are trying to see. Um, we, I also looked at um, the expression of some digestive es enzymes in the small intestine, and it was shown that MOS had um, a positive effect on gene expression of these uh, different digestive en enzymes, which um, would follow suit to have an increased uh, digestive capacity. So um, the animal is better able to digest its food. So um, that's why you'd be maybe seeing inf uh, improvements in the feed conversion ratios as well. So MOS also um, has been shown to have many effects on immunity, um, such as suppressing the fever response, um, enhancing the antigen uh, presentation, and modulating antibody productions. And what this does is that it um, better uh, enables the animal to resist uh, infection. So um, you're improving its immunity to uh, certain diseases. Um, I've uh, looked at some effects on um, Campylobacter and Clostridia, and while um, moss is um, a binder of things like Salmonella and E. coli, and they're flushed through the system, by stimulating the, immune, the immunity of an animal, it can also have beneficial effects on resisting disease from Campylobacters and uh, Clostridia. Um, also, the, these are a couple of genes that are related to the immune response, um, such as the lysozymes and the beta-2 microgarbulin. And again, we can see that the um, inclusion of moss in the diet significantly upregulated genes, um, which were associated um, uh, with, the, with the immunities. Lysozyme um, has bacteriolytic function, and the beta-2 microgarbulin uh, gene has um, effects on the antigen presentation. So this not only has benefits for the animal and the producer, but it also has shown to have uh, significant benefits for the consumer in that um, the meat is being produced in a way that the consumer is, is wants it to be produced, and um, it also has um, uh, reduced effects on the transmission of zoonotic pathogens. Um, if we take a look at, um, this was a pig trial that was carried out where there was um, a salmonella problem in the flock and uh, we introduced moss into the, the diets of these pigs and at the time when it was introduced um, there was a 28% uh, um, salmonella positive results from uh, meat juice samples that were tested. And in the space of 5%, this uh, was reduced to 0% uh, um, of the number of salmonella positive samples from meat juice samples. So passing through the food chain um, in respect to uh, food safety, um, these are the issues that uh, people are going to come across when they're switching to antibiotic or other alternatives. Um, some work that uh, was also looked at um, was the carriage of tetracycline or the carriage of antibiotic resistance genes um, in a poultry flock. And um, if we looked at uh, tetracycline A and tetracycline B resistance genes, um, when the birds were being sent to slaughter um, at 42 days, there was a significant uh, reduction in the carriage of um, the number of the antibiotic resistance genes um, from the birds uh, through to the slaughterhouse. So um, maybe there might be some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but just to conclude, um, I, there's always going to be a need for antibiotics. I'm not here to try and tell you that we're never going to need an antibiotic again. There's always going to be a need for antibiotics. But I think we're, what we need to do is we need to try looking at it from every angle to try and resist or to try and reduce the need for antibiotics. We need to try and minimize their use in food production animals and um, I think that there's going to be no silver bullet approach uh, for this. I've given you one example of how a prebiotic might um, tackle this but um, 
it's, it's not it's not going to be the only answer to um, replacing antibiotic growth promoters in the diet. I think that we're going to have to take a holistic approach, which is going to have to include um, infection control at the farm level, uh, good hygiene, and um, we're going to have to try and manipulate the gut uh, through nutritional support to help um, prevent uh, disease and to help increase the animal's immunity. And... Um, in my opinion, can we switch to antibiotic growth promoters? I think yes, we can. Um, there are to alternatives to antibiotic growth promoters, I should say, sorry. Um, but we need to bear in mind that when we're trying to consider alternatives for antibiotic growth promoters, that um, these alternatives must be safe, cost-effective, non-toxic, unlikely to become, resi to become resistant, and also efficacious. Yeah.